Um, Carrie, for many of you who would know, is a guitarist. She's a singer and songwriter with Slater Kinney and Wild Flag. Uh, she's the co-creator, writer and star of Portlandia and more recently has acted in the TV series Transparent and starred in the beautiful film Carol. Last year, Carrie published a memoir which uh, is called Hunger Makes Me a Modern Girl, which really captures that period of her life from a young girl uh, becoming a musician and all the way through to Slater Kinney's break in 2006. Today, she's here to talk with us. You've already made her welcome, but let's make her welcome again. Welcome, Carrie. <laughs> And I know a lot of you would have read her brilliant memoir, um, but I thought that we'd kick off, for anybody who hasn't or anybody who wants to relive it, with one of the, my favourite passages from it and have Carrie read from it herself. You want to go for it? Yes, I do want to. I'll go for it. Yes. Um, so I'll set it up a, a little bit. Uh, when I graduated from high school, before I went to college, I, um, I, I saw an advertisement in a Seattle newspaper um, that a band needed a guitarist. Uh, it said, girl guitarist wanted, no wanky solos. And um, I thought, that's great. I can't play any solos, <laughs> let alone um, a wanky one. So I um, called up this woman, and uh, her name was Elizabeth. It turned out she, it was this band called Seven Year Bitch, who were kind of big at the time, at least in Seattle. Um, their guitarist had um, sadly passed away and they needed a new one anyway. I was very uh, unfit for the job. Um, I showed up in a baseball cap and uh, I was growing up in the suburbs. I was wearing a giant white t-shirt and this, my dad's vest. <laughs> that was really, um, I, I describe it like, it just looks like two saloon doors on me. It's just this big <laughs> giant. Anyway, I was very uncool and uh, obviously I didn't get the job at all. <laughs> um, I'd, ne I'd really never drank before. They, they wanted a drink in the afternoon, and I thought, you know, in high school you only drink to, like, get blackout drunk, so I just, I said no thanks. Um, anyway, so that's the, the context here. Um, and, uh, yeah. She said I was, okay, yeah, I was too young, okay. I still didn't want to give up or let go. It didn't seem fair. I felt like this might be my only chance to be in a band, a real band. So I did what any teenager or girl would do. I wrote a letter wherein I compared myself to the Red Hot Chili Peppers guitarist, John Frusciante. <laughs> Frusciante had joined the Chili Peppers when he was 18 or 19, and even though he was a genius guitar player, a true wonderkind, and I only knew a few couple of chords, I felt like the comparison just might work. Not only was I likening myself to a virtuoso guitarist, but I was also displaying gumption and guts. At least that's what I thought. I would charm my way into this band, if not with my J. Crew outfits, then with Savvy. <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't end the letter there. Instead, I bared my soul. As in the letters I had written to soap stars and teenage heartthrobs in elementary school and junior high, I told Elizabeth about my entire life, how I didn't get along with my parents, about my mom leaving, the whole maudlin story. People think that the digital age and social networking sites like Facebook and Twitter nurture oversharing, but in 1992, there was nothing stopping me from treating any piece of paper like a personal diary. <laughs> I wanted so badly to be taken to some special place, to be asked into a secret club that would tr transform my life. I felt like music was that club, and to see inside for a moment and then be asked to leave was devastating. During the next few months, I occasionally ran into Elizabeth at Seattle shows and music festivals, like 1077's Enfest. She was always kind to me, but I had clearly become a pest. Later, when I knew what it felt like to carry the weight of your fans' aspirations, I would remember the way Elizabeth looked at me after I'd sent that letter, a look of pity, distrust, and weariness. There is a gulf of misunderstanding between musicians and their fans, and often so much desperation that the musician can't possibly assuage, rectify, or heal. You feel helpless and you feel guilty. With Slater Kinney fans, I tried to be generous, but I soon grew uneasy. For a long while, I could share nothing more than the music itself. I think I was too scared to be open with the fans because I knew how bottomless their need could be. How could I help if I was just like them? I was afraid I might not be able to lessen their pain or live up to their ideals. I'd be revealed as a fraud, unworthy and insubstantial. The disconnect between who I was on and off stage would be so pronounced as to be jarring. 
me, so small, so unqualified. In the early years of Slater Kinney, we played at Seattle's Crocodile Cafe. Elizabeth was at the show. By then, Seven Year Bitch had broken up. She came up to me, complimented my guitar playing, and told me she loved the band. Elizabeth didn't recognize me as the girl who had gone over to her house that day or written her an overly earnest tell-all letter. I was relieved that music had done exactly what I had always wanted it to do, which was turn me into someone else. This memoir is incredibly personal. You don't have to be a, a fan of Slater Kinney or Portlandia or Carrie necessarily, it's like quite an open book, but it's also, uh, in that other way, a very open book of, of your life and you share a lot. What compelled you to write it now, Carrie? Well, I think uh, it's a story of feeling disembodied and feeling on the fringe, on the margins, and going from that place as an outsider uh, to feeling embodied, feeling part of something through community and art. And that story is one of youth, and Slater Kinney, I think, was the right conduit um, and uh, for the story to be couched in, and that story had sort of already happened. So I wanted it to be kind of a, a slim uh, memoir that really just dealt with that specific journey. So I inserted into that um, fragments that served the narrative. And interestingly, you started writing it before Slater Kinney got back together, before you decided to make music again. And then you were re recording while you were writing this book. What was that like to be casting your mind back to that time and also writing something when that past had become your present again? Well, in some ways it was helpful because um, there were sections of the book, particularly um, involving recording, uh, where I think re-immersing myself into the world of Slater Kinney, uh, specifically in the context of a recording studio or within um, the dynamic of our songwriting, really helped uh, go back and fill in and illuminate some of those chapters that had to, had to do with the earlier records. Uh, we happened to be recording the most recent record with John Goodmanson, who had made about four of our other records. So um, recording usually starts in the afternoon and I get up really early, so I, had, I would write in the mornings and then go into the studio. So it kind of served, I guess, as, as a way of kind of, um, I don't know, just filling in some of, some of the color with those, of those chapters. And what other source material did you use other than having that as a reminder? Did you keep diaries at the time? Were there things written on scraps of papers? Like there's a lot of detail, mm -hmm. you know, going back 20 years in this book. Yeah, I mean, I think that's partly the job of a um, memoirist to, you know, not write what you know, but write what you want to know. You know, as someone like um, Patricia Hamphill said, you know, I think that you are looking to discover something. So there was source material. There were letters I'd written to friends that I um, asked, you know, for them back so I could sort of view them, because that's kind of how I kept a diary. I'm very, um, I have a lot of epistolary friendships and I still continue um, to engage with many people in that way. And um, so yeah, I would look at that. And I did, I do have notebooks from when we were songwriting, um, lyrical uh, fragments and um, sort of just exercises and notes about books I'm reading and stuff like that. So I was able to fill in somewhat, but a lot of it was just, um, you know, kind of going back and dissecting and, and really trying to um, illustrate uh, a story. You sort of touched on the confessional nature of your, some of your letters in that passage, but when you got those old letters back, did you see a line? Could you draw a line between young Carrie and Carrie of today? I'm not calling you old, by the way. No, that's fine. <laughs> I, Just later, Carrie. No, I'm, I'm very old. Um, <laughs> uh, I think that, uh, yeah, I, what was actually most surprising uh, recently uh, I, ha at, a, at a birthday, um, I had a friend, she read a letter to me that I had written to her uh, 20 years ago. And we really, um, I think, focus on the mercurial nature of ourselves and how we change, but there, I found it almost somewhat reassuring that there was um, a consistency uh, in my younger self. And it was very loquacious. It was, the letter was so formal. I was writing one of my best friends. And it was, you know, but I think, you know, when you write, you have a, kind of a character in your head. And mine is always like Virginia Woolf or something. It's just, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it was so strange. I was like, why am I using this flowery language? But I've always been very um, drawn to, to words. And so, yeah, I, I don't know. I guess. Um, even those early letters, as I describe um, in that passage, 
uh, were very verbose. You know, there's no reason <laughs> to write an eight-page letter <laughs> to um, <laughs> someone that doesn't know you. And uh, I uh, <laughs> and I did that a lot as a as a kid. So you know, anyway, yeah. <laughs> I think that you paint uh, young Carrie in a really delightful way. I definitely feel like I got to know uh, you as a, as a little girl and as a, a teenager as well throughout this book. Um, particularly interesting was how drawn you were to performing at a young age, mm -hmm. just that hunger for people paying attention to you. Can you remember that first moment where you realised this was something that was making you happy? Um, I mean, I think I, there was just never... It's, it was how I wanted to exist in a room, I think... Um, you know, I grew up in a household that was a little bit chaotic. There was, it was a fractious environment, um, not sort of outwardly, just it kind of like a, a, a slow, um, just it lacked clarity and focus. And so it was, it was really fraught with um, confusion. And performance requires choreography. And I think um, there is something about knowing what steps to take uh, that really help one navigate um, situations that feel unsafe. So I really liked sort of giving myself parameters in a situation because it kind of took the chaos and gave it shape and, and gave it an outline. And so, um, I mean, of course, that's me looking back on it intellectually, but at the time, it just felt like a wonderful way of interacting with people where the attention moved away from something that was you know, sad or frustrating and became joyful and became something that we could focus uh, our attention on. And uh, so I did a lot of silly things that were way outside of my skill set. Um, like ballet, you're probably thinking, oh, Carrie, you're great at ballet. No, was <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, but in any time, any, any friend that had like a little ballet costume, I'm like, I should try that on and perform for your parents, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just push them out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> was it addictive once you started? I mean, I don't, I don't see it as, I don't, I guess like the attention of it wasn't addictive. I just think it was something I was very, very drawn to, you know, that it, it felt um, like it stoked my creativity. I really liked, I was kind of a, like the neighborhood impresario. I was always trying to get all the kids to put on plays in the summer when we weren't at school. Um, I think it was just, how I was, it was my, it was what I was interested in. Mm. And you touch as well then just talking about how it was something that you could control. Um, for anyone who's read the book, you touch on a, a home life that at times is disruptive and sad. Your mother uh, left the family when you were 14. She was quite unwell. You were raised largely by your father after that. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that that was a way for you to capture a moment of your life and go, this is the one bit that I know that I've, you know, got a say in? The performance part? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, again, I was performing so much before that that I think it, you know, I mean, that's a psychoanalytical perspective on it. I, I really think that I just, you know, you, we, we all know people with those kind of performer personalities, and I really, um, I wasn't really theatrical, but I just really liked that kind of um, imaginative play. And um, I think it was more specifically music, I think, that came to answer um, some of the uh, disillusionment um, with and the disruption in my family that I think had a more particular um, pointed purpose. But I think all the earlier creativity stuff was just very much um, in my nature. Mm. What was the point? Do you think? Or can you recall the point that you felt that the stage was where you needed to be, up there playing music? That 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 was your home and and that would be your community. Um, probably just right now, just this stage now. Um, <laughs> Uh, Having an amazing moment right now. <laughs> um, oh, that kid. <laughs> she doesn't have to leave. She, she, she can hang out up here if she <laughs> See, she's probably just bummed that she's not in the center of attention. <laughs> she can't wait I get for it, Q &A. or he, I don't know. I can't tell from here, sorry. Um, just a baby, cute baby. Um, uh, let's see. I, you know... I think it was actually drama class um, more than music. I remember uh, being on stage in middle school. I don't know what the equivalent is here, junior high, basically 12, 13. And uh, our drama teacher assigned plays that were completely like not commensurate um, or appropriate for our age. <laughs> um, like, 
and or they were just so old fashioned and anachronistic as to not appeal to anyone. Like Springtime for Dan, like for some play from like 1940 that made no sense. Um, <laughs> tel Telephonitis, also probably from the 1950s, <laughs> and then. Um, <laughs> Ladies of the Tower, which were about the wives of Henry VIII. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but I remember just sitting in a very severe semicircle on stage in all black. And um, <laughs> anyway, uh, that was the moment I knew. <laughs> I just, um, that's actually true. <laughs> I really loved it. I just remember afterwards, the, um, the, prof the teacher was just like, Carrie, you were great up there. I wasn't. But I did have to have, to have like this sort of mental breakdown, and it was very dramatic, and I milked it for all it was worth. And I was just like, I never want to go back from acting crazy on stage. <laughs> um, I wouldn't mind asking if you could read another one of my favorite excerpts from the book. Um, it's the other bit that's been scribbled in. Sure. Uh, on page 55. Okay. This was about when you first discovered Olympia Band Bikini Kill. Sure. I had already been listening to punk and had related to storytellers like Joe Strummer and Paul Weller, but hearing Bikini Kill was like having someone illuminate my world for the first time. Here was a narrative that I could place myself inside, that I could share with other people to help explain how I felt, especially at a time when I was a shy and fairly inarticulate teen. I could turn the volume up on their songs and that loudness matched all my panic and fear, anger and emotions that seemed up until that point to be uncontrollable, even amorphous. Bikini Kill's music really gave me a form, a home, and a physicality to my teenage turmoil. Eventually, I was able to claim that tumultuousness, build on it, and make it my own. It's hard to express how profound it is to have your experience broadcast back to you for the first time. How shocking it feels to be acknowledged, as if your own sense of realness had only existed before as a concept. I felt like I could step inside something. It was a revelation. More than they influenced my style of playing, Bikini Kill helped to embolden me. I still see music as an act of defiance as much as it is an act of celebration. I don't understand how you can play a show or create any kind of work or performance without raising the stakes relatively high or with no stakes at all. If you are feeling too comfortable in your life, you have to find a way of challenging yourself in the creative process. You can't write from a place of entitlement. I think a lot of my ideas about earning it and owning it come from Bikini Kill's early influence on me. Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> You don't have to applaud after every passage. I mean, it's awesome. It's like the State of the Union. It's so awkward. <laughs> in 1994, you and Corin came here to Australia for the first time ever. Mm -hmm. um, you had no real title, tenuous links, a couple of tenuous links here. Mm -hmm. And you decided this was where you were going to be, the other side of the world, and start a band. Yeah. Why Australia? I know, good question. It's so far. Today when, when we would, I, we just flew this morning, um, not from the States, thankfully, I would be out of my mind, but um, from Brisbane. Uh, Brisbane, or Brizzy, I guess, as everyone calls it. Um, and uh, <laughs> when, uh, yeah, when we were landing, uh, I, I have been back to Australia since 94 a couple times, but it, it really did strike me how far away it is. Um, <laughs> from Olympia, Washington, where Corin, um, my bandmate, and I were um, both at university. Um, Olympia, Washington at the time was a very insular and um, very fertile music and art community, um, and one um, to which we owe a lot of our early ideology, and it really informed so much of um, who we were and how we thought about music and culture and the intersection of, of politics and art. Um, but I think that she and I knew that we wanted to distance ourselves um, to kind of create something hermetic and insular. And um, so we sort of put ourselves literally in, in the most distant place we could uh, to, to create an environment that was unique to, uh, to us and to our playing. And by doing so, I think it really helped create a vernacular um, and we really sort of learned how to play guitar kind of around each other, um, sort of filling in uh, the gaps. And um, I don't know, I think in some ways, because that community was so close-knit, 
it really required a, a breaking away and sort of a, a wrenching apart from that to um, make something that didn't sound like anything else. Mm. Um, so Australia, it was literally the first time I had I'd been overseas, the first time I'd gotten a passport, anything. So um, I'd been to Canada, that was about it. So, <laughs> yeah. Did it feel very different once you were here? You started in Sydney and then you went to Melbourne for a while? Yeah, I mean, there's obviously similarities. It, it first it felt a little bit like if San Diego was an entire country. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, it, I mean, the Pacific Northwest, it's, um, it's a moody, dreary uh, outpost of the United States. Uh, people go there, uh, historically, not so much anymore, um, people kind of went there to disappear. I mean, it, it has this kind of pioneering spirit. Um, I, I describe the light like a, in the winter, like a half-opened eye that just all day just barely opens and then it closes again, and it has uh, an almost um, psychologically oppressive quality, I think, a lot of um, the reason that some of the music from there uh, kind of has that hollowed out sound is, is the, because of that sort of seasonal depression and, and the environment. So landing in Australia, there was a, a brightness to it that I had never felt sort of, um, the landscape kind of felt, felt searing like it had been kind of baked on, you know, like in an oven. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> but I, I really liked that. I mean, you see yourself uh, in a different way, I think, which is also freeing. You know, when um, thinking about yourself for the first time as, you know, with these broader identities. When you live in a small community, everyone really knows who you are and kind of um, makes assumptions, and you sort of start to take on that and, and think that you're sort of confined by these um, boundaries and uh, identities that have kind of been created in relation to other people. You go and you, uh, you know, brought in the context and all of a sudden, you know, there's this elasticity to who you are and people see you differently and you start to play with uh, creativity and persona and, and just identity in a different way. So I think that was really important because we didn't see ourselves um, through a microscope. You know, we, we saw ourselves sort of telescopically and that was um, wonderful. That's mm -hmm. a wonderful way and a fortunate way, I think, to be able to start something. And there was a line as well, I guess, you know, the things that were happening even before the age of the internet uh, in scenes in Olympia were happening in Melbourne. There mm -hmm. was, you know, riot girl scenes that were living strong in, in Melbourne and the scene there as well. Mm -hmm. And you connected with a lot of people uh, in, in that regard. Could you kind of, draw, at the time, do you remember drawing a distinct line that this scene, which seemed to be somewhat fringe, was happening in these two very different parts of the world? Did you make that kind of connection and think that was significant? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, it's certainly before the internet and social media, you know, there were sort of, um, there was kinships between cities and communities and um, that would seem disparate but weren't. And I think people, like-minded people, found each other or just, you know, through sort of coincidence or osmosis, like, you know, these ideas kind of permeate culture. People were sort of reading, you know, the same books or listening to the same bands and, um, you know, at the time, people were disseminating information through fanzines and, you know, letter writing and, you know, certain labels, um, certain cities kind of were defining or curating uh, a, a sound um, or an ideology. So, yeah, I wasn't, I mean, I wasn't surprised, but at the same time, uh, it is kind of amazing and uh, it feels really sort of beautiful, actually, to be able to travel somewhere else and and have there be both a foreignness and commonality that are um, intersecting. Mm. You travelled with Corin, and mm -hmm. she's someone that you first saw up on stage in mm -hmm. her old band, Heavens to Betsy, and mm -hmm. um, it seemed from reading your book you were just completely captivated by this force, and for anybody who's ever seen Slater Kinney or is about to tonight for the first time, you will feel that full force when Corin Tucker sings <laughs> and plays uh, live on stage. But for you, was there anyone um, that you could have imagined playing guitar with and learning how to play you know, your guitar parts with and, and sing with? Was there ever anyone other than Corin, or was it absolutely, you know, the right fit as soon as you heard her play? I mean, there just, it, there weren't other options. I don't mean, I feel like there weren't, I mean, that's just what happened. I don't, I don't know another version. Um, you know, w we met and we had, um, uh, you know, like a, an intense connection. We had a musical connection and it just didn't go down a different path. So it's very much sliding doors to imagine me playing with someone else. Um, I, you know, I feel very lucky, but I also 
Um, I'm very intentional. You know, when I when I met Corn, when I when I saw her band play, I thought that that is who I want to play music with. You know, and I sort of. Um, went after that and she had been wanting to play. She was playing in a band where she was the only um, string instrument. It was just her and drums. And so she was ready to collaborate. So, you know, I mean, it's always a little bit of, of luck and fortitude, but often it, it's just, you know, pure sort of drive and intention. And I think, you know, that just kind of dovetailed hers and mine. Did you ever write her any letters? I think I did write, oh, like fan letters? Hmm. No. I didn't write her any fan. Probably, she, we wouldn't even be in a band. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> this is the point of difference. Yeah, she's. Um, but uh, yeah, I feel like you know, I, I probably did write her a letter. When I met her, I was still, I was switching. I was at one university, and I said, uh, I think I want to leave this town and move to Olympia and go to college there. And she said, Yeah, you should drop out. And I did. <laughs> um, but. Just stay in school. I did. I went. <laughs> I went and, and graduated from another school. But um, yeah, I did give her my my address. I was like, here, I'm moving back to my dad's house. I guess. So write me here. And she never wrote me. <laughs> but I met her. Met up with her again in Olympia. I want to touch a little bit about that time in Olympia at university and outside of university as well. Um, but just thinking about the songwriting on the Slater Kinney records, um, self awareness kind of came early. Uh, for you as a songwriter. I Want to Be a Joey Ramone from Call the Doctor was uh, sort of about that middle ground of both wanting to own the stage and also feeling somewhat un uncomfortable with that power. How did you work those two sides of wanting to be lost in the music but then you know, acutely aware of what you were doing at the same time? How do they live together? Uh, I think, you know, one... I've always been someone with... Uh, an affection, you know, towards uh, the observation of things. And it w it's hard for me to kind of go through life um, without analyzing it. So I feel like it was very, um, it just felt sort of preternational to go into songwriting and have there be, a, you know, two conversations, you know, that, that at one point, point I was singing it and then concomitant to singing and writing, I was thinking about what it meant. And I also think that we were very aware at the time of how, you know, our band was being seen. It felt like, you know, there was the entity that was the band and there was, you know, the, all the intrinsic qualities. And then we were sort of aware of um, these eyes on us. And we, so I think we tried to write our own narrative and sort of write ourselves into existence to kind of counteract you know, sort of the, the chatter and the discourse surrounding, you know, how people perceived us. So it was like we were sort of creating um, a, a mythology and, and kind of writing it down, documenting it at the same time. Um, so, yeah, I guess it's always been, especially early on, I think it really existed as part of the conversation of the band. Plus you have two intertwining guitar parts and two um, counter melodies and sometimes counter narratives. And so I think that we utilize that as a way of... Um, both singing and then sort of like a meta singing. So I don't know. I think the the meta discourse always existed within the band. So postmodern. What? So postmodern. I guess so. So pomo. Do you think that writing your songs helped you kind of more broadly stake your place in music? That you were able to sort of not wish your way into it, but write your way into you know this this place that you wanted to be. Writing about it. Um, yeah. Writing songs in particular. Writing songs. I mean, I think our goals we're always just to write good songs. You know, I mean, I think that every time we approached a record, it was about pushing the narrative of the band further, pushing the skills set of the band further, pushing um, the world of the band further. And that was um, mostly, you know, to, to innovate, to have each album sound unique from the last. So, I mean, I think really the focus was just writing good songs. Mm. How close was your performer self to your private self, do you think? Hmm. I feel like my performer self, especially with music, but I think also with, with acting, obviously, then you're kind of um, taking on many you know, permutations of, of self and personhood. Um, it, it is different. I'm very, uh, you know, on, on stage, that's a, that's a different world. It's something to embody, and I like that you know, the boundaries are so broad. You know, there's very few moments um, in life where it's, it's sanctioned um, to exhibit a level of, that is unhinged. 
um, angry, uh, to exhibit, you know, any a range that goes from you know ecstasy to agony. You can't really do that in your daily life um, without ending up like in a straitjacket or, um, you know. So I think that I I really take that. Um, I, I I really am grateful for that. I don't take it for granted, and that is definitely not how I am in my regular life, which is pretty quiet. Yeah, at the, I mean, that's what it seems like. You can go to bed at 10, get up at 6. It's not really the rock and roll world, is it? N no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, yeah, I do go to bed pretty early. I hadn't even told you that, but this I do. <laughs> <laughs> I've researched your bedtime, Carrie. Okay, well. <laughs> um, let's jump back into that time in Olympia uh, because it's, it's a place that, like, you know, many great musical towns, Athens, Georgia, you know, Seattle, obviously, Olympia, it's kind of got this mythology about it. Um, and you sort of share a, a, a really wonderful narrative of your time there and, and particularly your sort of sexual fluidity of that time and, and this sort of scene that acted as a learning experience as much as the university degree you were or weren't doing. Mm -hmm. um, was that a really important period in your life in helping figure out who you would be? I think so. I mean, I would say that for many people that, you know, age range, uh, you know, late teens, early 20s, whether you're at university or not, is such a formative time. I mean, it feels like there's an openness that um, I think, you know, as, as you get older, there's sort of sometimes an encroaching cynicism or skepticism that you often have to kind of keep at bay if you want to kind of remain um, like, you know, impressionable. But at, as a young person and in Olympia at the time, you know, I felt just an incessant kind of optimism and, and openness and curiosity. And um, what I love about curiosity is it keeps you sort of moving forward in, in the world and um, you don't shut yourself off to things. Uh, it was a very interesting uh, environment to be in because in some ways it was very matrifocal and it, compared to many other um, music and art scenes there were women at every level of, of power there whether they were running the labels um, or had their own recording studios or in bands um, there, so that was definitely different from Seattle where I'd grown up you know where it was um, especially the music business uh, was much more uh, male focused. Um, so, so there was that. And then uh, the university I went to, um, sort of the pedagogy was based on this thing called the seminar, which, you know, kind of dismantles sort of the hierarchical structure of lecturer and, and student body. And um, it was all about this kind of, you know, collective um, discourse. And I think so many people in the music scene in Olympia had gone to school at Evergreen that we were kind of uh, music scene in dialogue with itself, and it was a, a college in dialogue with itself, and I saw the way that those sort of tentacles reached out and really um, influenced, I think, the whole music scene there. Mm. And I'm sure as well, like, the way that you describe it and also just as a scene, uh, did it kind of fuel what would then become some of the stories in Portland here? I mean, there's a very kind of there's something about scenes which are both really cool but also really frustrating. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, you know, things that seem like they're going to be really inclusive are often the most exclusive things. You know, you think like, oh, all these people, these misfits, they've come together and, you know, they're going to just include every misfit and then you go to these, you know, communities or scenes and you, there's all these rules. And you're just like, uh, I don't know how to navigate any of these rules. Mm. I feel like, you know, I'm not wearing the right thing or talking the, the right way. You know, somehow I've missed out on all the colloquialisms. And then, um, so yeah, then you're sort of confounded by these, these rules. And um, certainly that's the basis of something like Feminist Bookstore in Portlandia or just that, um, <laughs> you know, just, just any, anything that I think aims, has these very sort of high-minded um, intentions, you know, but kind of falls short um, by either kind of undermining itself or, you know, just creating an environment that's actually hostile. Mm. Um, so as much as I value uh, and owe a lot to Olympia, I think some of that uh, confusion of trying to navigate the, the environment definitely um, kind of crept into Portlandia. Well, there's that saying, which is one of my favorite sayings, which is comedy is tragedy plus time. Mm -hmm. what, what's it like for you to be able to parody that world that you were inside of? 
now, you know, 20 years later on this, this television show, which has just, you know, kicked off a sixth season. Right. Well, I mean, there, yeah, it is, um, it is parody and it is satirical, but it's also, I think, just me and Fred and the writers kind of in conversation um, with each other and with an audience about one's relationship to place, you know, the being in conflict or concert with where we live and kind of questioning our own um, kind of struggles um, and whether these struggles really are kind of the struggles of privilege. Like when you're, you know, at a grocery store and you're really worried that something's local versus organic, like that's a really privileged kind of <laughs> problem to have. And um, so, you know, I think a lot of the, the show is just, is, I think it's a, a conversation culturally, at least in the States, but I think elsewhere that's kind of reached a tipping point is have we gone in the right direction? We've kind of over curated ourselves and our neighborhoods and, you know, have we started to kind of sort ourselves away from difference? Um, and in some ways, I think that's the exploration of Portlandia and why it, um, even though it's very specific, it also uh, is relatable everywhere. Do you think much has changed in those kind of fringe communities from the 90s to the now fringe communities that exist but seemingly on larger scale, like, you know, hipsters are mainstream now, but do you think much has changed with the, that sense of inclusion and exclusion? Um, I mean, I think that there are different ways that, I mean, I think we've, there are similarities, but I think that in some ways that is, it's still kind of an alienating sort of, of culture, you know, I think it's just that, like, things that kind of started small and, and seemed precious have become more mainstream, but I think there is still an alienation, I mean, at least in, in the U.S., I mean, you have this tag of, like, elitism, sort of, that starts to apply to, um, you know, certain communities, and I think it's actually a valid, you know, conversation, so it kind of, in, instead of it being alienating, um, or, I mean, it is alienating, but I think in a different way. Because mm -hmm. I think people are starting to wonder, like, whether we've kind of parceled ourselves, you know, I guess it's just, it's just a privileged problem, I guess. You know what I mean? It's like the narcissism of small ideas, is how I put it. You know? What's Olympia like now? I've still never been there. Um, I haven't been to Olympia in a long time. It's a really, you know when you live in a place and it's like you see it through rose-colored glasses and it was so site-specific, so contextual. And in my mind, Olympia was like the first time I'd eaten Thai food. I mean, it was like, <laughs> it was like the first time I had done all these things. And so in my mind, it was like this huge city. And when I go, with the few times I've been back there, it's very small. It's a weird intersection culturally because it's, a, it's the state capital. Um, it's a working class, uh, like longshoreman, you know, port town. And then you have a really liberal college. So um, where that coalesces is sometimes awkward, but interesting. But it's mostly just kind of a small town, I realize. Like mm -hmm. at the time, it felt like it was expanding all of my horizons. But um, yeah, it was actually very insular. Some people discovered you through your music, Carrie. Mm -hmm. um, there'll be people in this room that uh, came to you via Portlandia and some even maybe just by being recommended this beautiful memoir that you gave us late last year. Do you see a common thread that connects all of what you do creatively? Can you see something that runs through it all? Uh, I mean, I guess the writing, and I think that my um, desire to connect, I think, and has always permeated everything I've done from Slater Kinney to Portlandia. Um, I wrote for NPR in the States for a while. Just, you know, kind of being in um, dialogue with myself and the people around me and trying to create something that was meaningful. Um, but I would say that writing is the commonality when I look back, you know, because I, I was sort of was always kind of asked to comment on everything I was doing. I write about in the book how um, with Slater Kinney, like a, a couple of years into it, people started asking me to write essays or to sort of comment on that. And then I sort of realized, well, that was my interest. And then in, at university, I studied sociolinguistics. So I was, you know, always thinking about, um, you know, like discourse analysis and the ways that we talk to one another and the ways we present ourselves online. I think that exploration of communication has, that's sort of the theme, but, but the writing in terms of like the creative endeavor has been the most consistent thing. 
Is that something that you also saw once you had the chance to look back and particularly in looking back at your life through the memoir that it was, you know, that the benefit of retrospect? That writing was the thing? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that even now as I, you know, plan next steps, I feel like writing is it's probably the hardest of the things that I do but also the most rewarding and I think um, the means through which I express myself best. What are those next steps? What else do you want to do? I can't talk about it right now, but um, <laughs> no, I mean, I have, I have, you know, I have plans. Um, it's always good to have plans. Yeah. Isn't that like the worst question? <laughs> what are you, what are you doing next, tomorrow? Um, Just be happy with what I've done now. Yeah, I feel fine. Tomorrow, I, I feel like I've been on a plane every day, so um, what am I doing this afternoon? Playing a show. Tomorrow, I'll have a day off in Sydney, maybe go to the beach. Um, I don't know. I, I do have next steps, but... <laughs> Maybe you guys will do a better job of getting that out of Carrie than I. Um, we have two <laughs> microphones set up in each corner of the room. There's one over there, mic number one, and mic number two over there. If anybody has any questions for Carrie, do you want to make your way down to the mic? And we can take them, um, and I'll just point. Also, um, love a big preamble. No, I don't. <laughs> If you want to tell Carrie about how you discovered her music over a whole essay, maybe write her a letter. Um, there's probably going to be a lot of people asking questions, so we'd appreciate you to you know, keep it to the question and, and not the sweeping statement beforehand. Uh, number one, please. Hi, um, my name's Hannah. Um, I'm a woman in a band, so that's where my question is sort of aimed. Um, so there's been a bit of conversation in Australia and in the world about... Um, the number of women who play at festivals and how sometimes there's a really small number of women who get booked to play things like that. And um, in Australia, there's only 20% of women registered with APRA and AMCOS who actually make money as songwriters. Um, but I also have friends who are women musicians who hate the fact that people bring up that they're a woman in a band and they don't ever want to be talked about as a woman in a band. Um, so I'm interested in your thoughts on how much is it okay to talk about being a woman in a band? And <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like how much? Let me prescribe it... the exact percentage. That's correct. Because <laughs> it comes down to a, a figure, and we we're gonna we're gonna uh, solve this scientifically. I, I can't speak for anyone else. I mean, I, that's that's completely uh, unfair. I mean, I, I have similar. Um, the same empirical evidence that you do in terms of I know some people that um, it I, the most my most common answer when I when people ask me you know what is it like to be a woman in a band um, I say well you asking me that question is part of the experience this conversation is part of the experience of you know being female and doing anything women in comedy women sitting in chairs you know like. <laughs> It's just part of the conversation. And you can, I think you can divorce yourself from it without, I mean, I think you should be able to do that without judgment, but I, I, I do think that um, th I just feel like there's sort of a lack of sophistication and imagination in terms of like, how can we think more, um, you know, in, in more complex ways about this? Um, and it's, it's hard because I understand the fatigue of, of talking about it. Um, but I also understand um, the importance of visibility. Uh, so I can't prescribe a number of how important or not important it is to talk about it. I think, I think it really is personal and I'm grateful for the people that are talking about it constantly. And I'm also grateful for the people that are just making music and speaking through that. So um, that's all I can say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, over here at two. <laughs> well, um, I think you're the last question, so it better be awesome. Because <laughs> there's, there's no one else standing up there. So this, whatever you say, is like the end. Someone really needs to line up. Um, my name's Rachel. Hi. Harry, and thank you guys for giving the talk today. I thought it was so good. Um, I'm a writer, and I'm working on a project at the moment that is memoristic. Um, and like Zan said at the start, like quite a lot of your memoir is quite personal and confessional. And I was wondering how, um, 
how you sort of push through to write about those, like, memories that are quite painful and, like, for lack of a better word, what self-therapy, like, did you use to, to get through that? I didn't really think of it as therapeutic. I really approached it structurally and um, with a strong focus on narrative and suspense and arc. And uh, I knew the stories that I wanted to tell that would serve that, those larger themes. And um, I actually found that the parts that, as a reader, potentially feel might come across as the most vulnerable, you know, often you're focusing on, on syntax, you know, and you're, you're focusing on the, the tempo of that paragraph. Um, it wasn't, so yeah, it's, I guess to me, it was so different than like writing a diary or something that feels therapeutic or sitting in a, you know, analyst's office and pouring your heart out. But the process of, of writing about painful experiences to me, the pain is just getting up in the morning and writing and having it be a good sentence or a good <laughs> paragraph or a good book. That to me is much hard, harder. Only in retrospect, I think, um, I, when I was doing the audio book, uh, then it was, I was sort of, sort of approaching it with a little bit more objectivity. Were, was it hard and maybe had moments that were therapeutic, but certainly um, I did not approach, uh, I think it, there's just too much construction involved really to, um, Maybe a first draft, I guess. I think a draft is where you get out that, you know, that overwrought therapy stuff, and then you just get in there with an ax, and you're, you know, you write. You just you, you figure it out. So. With a memoir, though, obviously there's other people involved. You've got mm -hmm. those, those closest to you whose stories are being told. How did mm -hmm. they react? You know, I found that people are more offended when they're not included. <laughs> <laughs> So everyone should be grateful who was included. I think we have, uh, you're saved. One more question, possibly, or maybe one, a couple more. Uh, over here at uh, Mike One. Hi, uh, my name's Lise, lovely to hear from you. Hi. Um, I know that it's a fatiguing conversation, being a woman in rock. <laughs> it's not interesting. But I suppose I wanted to ask about, we were talking about scenes and being involved in them and how specific they can be. And I wondered how much, I mean, obviously you're in an all-female band and how much of that is being in conversation with other women was specific to the art that you were producing and a lot of the, from the memoir, it seems a lot of the people you were getting inspiration from were women. Do you think that there was that divide that you weren't being inspired by the men in that scene or was it you just went in contact with men that were inspiring or was there a specific conversation that we were having? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, definitely influence-wise, uh, I, I don't think it kind of a split down, down a gender line. Um, you know, my favorite guitarists are in Gang of Four and television, in, those are guys. Um, I, I guess in terms of inspiration, um, yeah, it's, it's a little more fluid. I, it, and, and, and the tricky thing about asking um, what it's like to sort of play with Janet and Corin is that I don't really have another experience to compare it to. So it's hard to kind of step outside of how we operate and c compare it. Um, you know, I do think that, uh, I mean, I really, like Janet is just one of the best drummers. And the fact that she, you know, I, I do, I guess, like playing with people and women often fall into this category of someone that's going to be underestimated because then you have something to prove. And when you get on stage with someone or you work with someone that you think everyone out there is gonna just think this person can't do it, then you're gonna damage someone when you do it because you're gonna, <laughs> you're gonna surprise them. And I think surprise, you know, you have to kind of create, like that's why, you know, there's, I think people are really drawn to any narrative that comes from a place where someone has been underestimated because then you're clawing and you're scratching and that can come from anyone. But I think for some people that's, you know, harder to create. If you just come from a place where you were born with the assumption, like I can, I'm going to be president because I've only ever seen these kind of people be president or I've only ever seen these kind of people play guitar. There's a certain kind of entitlement that I think you can still obviously be a brilliant artist and 
come from a place of entitlement, but I personally, I think, am drawn to people that have operated in the margins and have push, pulled the center over to the margins instead of people that have started at the margins and drifted towards the center. And you know, Janet and Corin, for a variety of reasons, perhaps including their gender, both encompass that. And I, uh, across the board, I'm drawn to artists um, with that, uh, you know, point of view. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mike, too, over here in the corner. Um, this is so lame, but <laughs> <laughs> what do you, I was sort of like daydreaming about this when I saw Miranda July walk in before. Uh, but yeah. I was sort of wondering what you guys do when you hang out together. <laughs> 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 Good question. Uh, is she here? You came, oh, I thought you were gonna go see that other person. <laughs> um, I can't even hear you. <laughs> Last, Maybe Miranda should come to the mic. Yeah, Miranda, come up here. Last time we hung out, I think was on your birthday. No, we danced last time. I had a, I actually, I'm, you can ask Miranda, this is not a lie. I'm very antisocial, right? Okay. <laughs> Um, I mean, I love like one-on-one -on -one interactions and small group dynamics, but I wanted to have this like housewarming dance party. And um, so we conferred on our outfits like friends do. Um, I said, what are you wearing? She texted me a picture of her outfit. It was awesome. Um, I said, yes, I'm going to wear a dress too. Well, you know, she was wearing shorts, um, cool shorts. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, and uh, so she came over, and this is why um, she's basically, she, we, one reason that you have a best friend is so that they come really early to the party. <laughs> and so she kind of helped like broker the, when the other early people came. The, Miranda was there to help usher them in and get them ice or just, so I didn't have to talk to them because you know how people come to your party and you're like, I don't know who you are. And <laughs> um, so, yeah, we do just, yeah, we don't, like, you know, d do, like, drawing or, like, hang out and, like, <laughs> we don't just, like, paint each other's bodies and, like, do <laughs> stuff like that. We, we will later, though. <laughs> That's the next session. Yeah. Um, is that some, oh, yeah, we have someone else at the mic, too. Go ahead. Hi, Carrie. I'm Hi. Zan. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, in your book you're very uh, open about the physical and emotional toll that touring had on you. Uh -huh. um, this time around you've been touring with No Cities to Love, you've been doing the book tour, you've been filming Portlandia and Transparent. Um, this seems like a very personal question, but how are you? Oh. <laughs> well, thanks for asking. Um, it only took 55 minutes for someone to ask how I was. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, I'm, I'm really good. I mean, I think that, um, I feel like, honestly, the happiest I've been. Uh, it's just, it's been, it was such a rewarding year um, l last year, and I feel like um, I just surround myself with really wonderful people, and it, it was so lucky, um, the endeavors um, that with which I'm involved are, you know, there's wonderful people who, who, I'm, who I work with and fans of the band and the show, and um, so yeah, things are good. I do have a blister, um, <laughs> but I'll, I'll survive. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thanks for asking. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't ask earlier. No, I was, I was fine. Um, you can see Slater Kinney tonight at the Opera House. I know I'll be there, and very exciting that they've returned after about ten years away since their last Australian tour. They're going to be on stage. Janet is one of the world's best drummers, I can confirm. And, uh, as a trio, they're just incredible to watch live on stage. Uh, Carrie's also signed a number of her brilliant memoirs um, in the bookshop, in the Kinnikunia bookshop at the front. If you are quick, I'm sure that you can buy one that has been signed. Hunger Makes Me a Modern Girl. And yeah, Portlandia, of course, um, is continuing. Season six, there'll be another season as well. Yes. So you're going to continue making things, which we're um, so happy about. And thank you so much for giving us your time and, and sharing your life with us today, Carrie. Thank you, Zan. Carrie Brownson. It's also, uh, in that other way, a very open book of, of your life, and you share a lot. What compelled you to write it now, Carrie? Well, I think uh, it's a story of feeling disembodied and feeling on the fringe, on the margins, and going from that place as an outsider 
uh, to feeling embodied, feeling part of something through community and art. And that story is one of youth, and Slater Kinney, I think, was the right conduit um, and uh, for the story to be couched in, and that story had sort of already happened. So I wanted it to be kind of a, a slim uh, memoir that really just dealt with that specific journey. So I inserted into that um, fragments that served the narrative. And interestingly, you started writing it before Slater Kinney got back together, before you decided to make music again, and then you were re recording while you were writing this book. What was that like, to be casting your mind back to that time and also writing something when that past had become your present again? Well, in some ways it was helpful because um, there were sections of the book, particularly um, involving recording, uh, where I think re-immersing myself into the world of Slater Kinney, uh, specifically in the context of a recording studio or within um, the dynamic of our songwriting, really helped uh, go back and fill in and illuminate some of those chapters that had to, had to do with the earlier records. Uh, we happened to be recording the most recent record with John Goodmanson, who had made about four of our other records. So um, recording usually starts in the afternoon and I get up really early, so I, had, I would write in the mornings and then go into the studio. So it kind of served, I guess, as, as a way of kind of, um, I don't know, just filling in some of, some of the color with those, of those chapters. And what other source material did you use other than having that as a reminder? Did you keep diaries at the time? Were there things written on scraps of papers? Like there's a lot of detail, mm -hmm. you know, going back to Um, Carrie, for many of you who would know, is a guitarist. She's a singer and songwriter with Slater Kinney and Wild Flag. Uh, she's the co-creator, writer and star of Portlandia and more recently has acted in the TV series Transparent and starred in the beautiful film Carol. Last year, Carrie published a memoir which uh, is called Hunger Makes Me a Modern Girl, which really captures that period of her life from a young girl uh, becoming a musician and all the way through to Slater Kinney's break in 2006. Today she's here to talk with us. You've already made her welcome, but let's make her welcome again. Welcome, Carrie. <laughs> And I know a lot of you would have read her brilliant memoir, um, but I thought that we'd kick off, for anybody who hasn't or anybody who wants to relive it, with one of the, my favourite passages from it and have Carrie uh, read from it herself. You want to go for it? Yes, I do want to. I'll go for it. Yes. Um, so I'll set it up a, a little bit. Uh, when I graduated from high school, before I went to college, I, um, I, I saw an advertisement in a Seattle newspaper um, that a band needed a guitarist. Uh, it said, girl guitarist wanted no wanky solos. And um, I thought, that's great. I can't play any solos, <laughs> let alone um, a wanky one. So I um, called up this woman and uh, her name was Elizabeth. It turned out she, it was this band called Seven Year Bitch who were kind of big at the time, at, at least in Seattle. Um, their guitarist had um, sadly passed away and they needed a new one anyway. I was very uh, unfit for the job. Um, I showed up in a baseball cap and uh, I was growing up in the suburbs. I was wearing a giant... 20 years in this book. Yeah, I mean, I think that's partly the job of a um, memoirist to, you know, not write what you know, but write what you want to know. You know, as someone like um, Patricia Hamphill said, you know, I think that you are looking to discover something. So there was source material. There were letters I'd written to friends that I um, asked you know, for them back so I could sort of view them, because that's kind of how I kept a diary. I'm very, um, I have a lot of epistolary friendships, and I still continue um, to engage with many people in that way. And um, so yeah, I would look at that. And I, did, I do have notebooks from when we were songwriting, um, lyrical uh, fragments and um, sort of just exercises and notes about books I'm reading and stuff like that. So I was able to fill in somewhat, but a lot of it was just, um, you know, kind of going back and dissecting and, and really trying to um, illustrate uh, a story. You sort of touched on the confessional nature of your, some of your letters in that passage, but when you got those old letters back, did you see a line? Could you draw a line between young Carrie and Carrie of today? I'm not calling you old, by the way. No, that's fine. I, Just later, Carrie. No, I'm, I'm very old. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think that, uh, yeah, I, what was actually most surprising uh, recently, uh, I, ha at, a, at a birthday, um, I had a friend 
she read a letter to me that I had written to her uh, 20 years ago. And we really, um, I think, focus on the mercurial nature of ourselves and how we change, but there, I found it almost somewhat reassuring that there was um, a consistency uh, in my younger self, and it was very loquacious. It was, the letter was so formal. I was writing one of my best friends, and it was, you know, but I think, you know, when you write, you have a, kind of a character in your head, and mine is always, like, Virginia Woolf or something. It's just... <laughs> You know, it's, it's, it was so strange. Club, and to see inside for a moment and then be asked to leave was devastating. During the next few months, I occasionally ran into Elizabeth at Seattle shows and music festivals, like 1077's Enfest. She was always kind to me, but I had clearly become a pest. Later, when I knew what it felt like to carry the weight of your fans' aspirations, I would remember the way Elizabeth looked at me after I'd sent that letter, a look of pity, distrust, and weariness. There's a gulf of misunderstanding between musicians and their fans, and often so much desperation that the musician can't possibly assuage, rectify, or heal. You feel helpless and you feel guilty. With Slater Kinney fans, I tried to be generous, but I soon grew uneasy. For a long while, I could share nothing more than the music itself. I think I was too scared to be open with the fans because I knew how bottomless their need could be. How could I help if I was just like them? I was afraid I might not be able to lessen their pain or live up to their ideals. I'd be revealed as a fraud, unworthy and insubstantial. The disconnect between who I was on and off stage would be so pronounced as to be jarring. Me, so sw small, so unqualified. In the early years of Slater Kinney, we played at Seattle's Crocodile Cafe. Elizabeth was at the show. By then, Seven Year Bitch had broken up. She came up to me, complimented my guitar playing, and told me she loved the band. Elizabeth didn't recognize me as the girl who had gone over to her house that day or written her an overly earnest tell-all letter. I was relieved that music had done exactly what I had always wanted it to do, which was turn me into someone else. This memoir is incredibly personal. You don't have to be a, a fan of Slater Kinney or Portlandia or Carrie necessarily, it's like quite an open book, but a white t-shirt and this, my dad's vest. <laughs> that was really, um, I, I describe it like, it just looks like two saloon doors on me, it's just this big <laughs> giant. Anyway, I was very uncool and uh, obviously I didn't get the job at all. <laughs> um, I'd, ne I'd really never drank before, they, they wanted to drink in the afternoon and I thought, you know, in high school, you only drink to like get blackout drunk. So I just, I said no thanks. Um, anyway, so that's the, the context here. Um, and uh, yeah, she said I was, okay, yeah, I was too young, okay. I still didn't want to give up or let go. It didn't seem fair. I felt like this might be my only chance to be in a band, a real band. So I did what any teenager or girl would do. I wrote a letter wherein I compared myself to the Red Hot Chili Peppers guitarist, John Frusciante. <laughs> Frusciante had joined the Chili Peppers when he was 18 or 19, and even though he was a genius guitar player, a true wunderkind, and I only knew a few couple of chords, I felt like the comparison just might work. Not only was I likening myself to a virtuoso guitarist, but I was also displaying gumption and guts. At least that's what I thought. I would charm my way into this band, if not with my J. Crew outfits, then with Savvy. <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't end the letter there. Instead, I bared my soul. As in the letters I had written to soap stars and teenage heartthrobs in elementary school and junior high, I told Elizabeth about my entire life, how I didn't get along with my parents, about my mom leaving, the whole maudlin story. People think that the digital age and social networking sites like Facebook and Twitter nurture oversharing, but in 1992, there was nothing stopping me from treating any piece of paper like a personal diary. <laughs> I wanted so badly to be taken to some special place, to be asked into a secret club that would transform my life. I felt like music was that.